My mother has always been a collector. Our house was like a museum that switched out its displays every few months. There were the Persian rugs, the hand embroidered tablecloths from France, the paintings from the beachside town in Brazil, the wooden sculptures from Thailand, the china cabinet from China, and the list goes on. I grew up in a home where money was being spent on art. So from a young age, I believed that art had worked. I went to art school because I knew that I wanted to work in the creative industry. And during that time, I also realized that it was important for me to have a career that wasn't just fulfilling on an individual level, but one that also had an impact to society. And so this prompted me to ask whether art could really have a meaningful impact to our lives, and if so, in what ways? Today, after having worked a few years in the industry, I wanted to share some of the insights as well as the answers to this question. Let's start out by talking about museums, probably something that we're all familiar with. So what is the purpose of a museum? The role of a national museum is to preserve artworks that are deemed culturally and historically significant and to engage and educate the public. One of the most important roles in a museum is the curator. Curators are storytellers and educators who provide us with the context of why certain artworks are so significant, and thus which works should be purchased by museums and how they should be displayed. In other words, curators are, have the tremendous responsibility of shaping and interpreting how we perceive culture and history itself. I'd like to show you an example of the impact of a well-curated exhibition. In 2018, I visited the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, where I encountered an exhibition titled, I am you, you are too. To borrow a quote from the press release, at a time of heightened uncertainty, tensions, and geopolitical tensions, I am you, you are too, foregrounds works from the Walker's collection that explore contemporary life through themes of citizenship and belonging, borders and barriers, and ways in which our everyday life informs our understanding of ourselves. In this exhibition, I distinctly remember the impact of two works. The first work is Gary Simmons, Us and Them. This is an installation consisting of two embroidered cotton robes. Simmons is an African-American artist from New York whose practice grapples with the, cultural, the collective memories of African-American identities in, in American history. In this work, viewers are asked to choose between us or them, and in the process, forced to pick a side. These two words, of course, have been carefully picked. The, weight, the terminology carries the weight of bipartisan rhetoric racial discrimination, and gang affiliations. The choice of garment is also symbolic. On one hand, the robe is associated with luxury, power, and affluence in contemporary American pop culture. It is adorned by rappers and music videos, as well as world-famous boxers on national television. The resulting work uh, on the other hand, cotton has an inescapable association to slavery. The resulting work embodies the fractured identities of African Americans throughout American history. The second work is Carrie James Marshall's painting, Blind Ambition. Marshall is known for his portrait paintings of African Americans. Portrait paintings have historically been known to be the domain of white European artists but Marshall appropriates the genre of painting in order to depict the realities of African Americans in the 21st century. In the painting, a black man wearing a suit is standing next to a ladder with the words success and ambition. The American dream was once a symbol of hope to countless white American families, but to African Americans, it has come to symbolize yet another false promise. 
It is also important to point out that Adrienne Edwards, an African-American woman, was a co-curator of this exhibition. With all of this in mind, just a year and a half later, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, causing an unprecedented worldwide movement in support of, of Black Lives Matter. A well-curated exhibition is a reflection of our times. And at a critical time in American history, Edwards provided a pl public platform for Simmons and Marshall to initiate a conversation about how Americans deal with race, socioeconomic divisions, and identities. In a way, the exhibition also held us, the viewers, accountable by involving us into this discourse. If this is one way art can provide cultural and historical value to society, I'd also like to address the economic impact of an exhibition. Just one exhibition requires a lot of people. First of all, the exhibition must be able to attract a number of visitors, and so a PR team is assembled. At the very least, a writer, a graphic designer, a PR representative, and a strategist are needed. Then there's a process of actually acquiring the artworks. Although a lot of the works will come from the museum's collection, many of them will also be loaned from artists, private collections, galleries, and other museums. A lawyer will have to draft up the loan agreements, while a person in charge of shipping and logistics will make sure to insure the artworks, as well as keep track of where they are. A conservator will be present in case a work is damaged during travel or throughout the period of the exhibition. There will be a team of technicians who will then install the artworks while ensuring public safety. There's another team in charge of merchandising who will create the goods that will be sold to the public. And lastly, an archivist will make sure to document all of the works as well as the exhibition into the museum's database. There are many other roles that I didn't get into, but this is just an example to provide you with the numerous jobs that one exhibition can create. While we're on the topic of economic impact, I also want to point out that there are many other ways in which art can provide socioeconomic impact to, on a larger scale. Recently, some governments have been taking a more active role in supporting the arts and culture sector. In Japan, for example, this year, the Agency for Cultural Affairs was allocated a budget of approximately 900 million US dollars. One approach Japan has been taking is to channel some of these funds into local and independent artistic initiatives, particularly those in rural areas faced with problems like depopulation, aging, and economic decline. You may have noticed a recent rise in the number of art festivals held in rural areas in Japan. And this is in part thanks to one particular art festival that has had a measurable impact in the revitalization of a prefecture. The Setoichi Art Triennale is an art festival that, ha that promotes local art, food, music, and crafts, and is held in 12 different islands in Kagawa. What started out as a small private initiative has over the years expanded into a regional one, co-organized and co-funded by the prefecture itself. In 2019, the festival was reported to have attracted a total of 1.2 million visitors. And the Bank of Japan Takamatsu branch estimates the economic effect as approximately 18 billion yen. The influx of visitors not only enlivened the area during the event, but also afterwards, as local initiatives generated new businesses. This has since been used as a case story for art tourism as a means of rural revitalization in other parts of Japan. Japan is not the only country that has been actively investing in the arts and culture sector in order to resolve socioeconomic issues in rural areas. In 2016, I was invited to take part in a collaborative artist residency, a program that was part of a larger regeneration project on the island of Stokoya in Norway. The goal of the project was to attract 
creative individuals and businesses to create a new small-scale urban development. Food, architecture and art were the three main components of the project. Renowned Scandinavian chefs were invited to use local ingredients and make new recipes. Architects were asked to imagine new sustainable housing systems. And artists were invited to engage with the community and create artworks with local ingredients. At the end of our residency, my peers and I created a conceptual work resembling a plaque with the inscription of the first few lines of Frank Sinatra's famous song, New York, New York. The song, of course, is an homage to a city that makes dreams come true. The same sentiment of hopes and dreams are echoed by the founders of this ambitious project of Stokoya. This work is now a permanent part of the island and stands as a symbolic totem of its mission. In closing, I wanted to share that my journey in the creative industry hasn't been easy and that I'm still trying to figure out what role I would like to play in it. I want to do something that is creative and socially meaningful as a living, so I've had to explore with many different roles. I worked as an assistant for a contemporary Japanese artist, a translator for a publication company, a salesperson and logistical manager for an art gallery, and now I work as a brand design manager for a global architecture firm. It's not always obvious what skills I'm acquiring are leading up to, and it hasn't been a straightforward career path. But this has forced me to think flexibly and creatively in completely new ways. And precisely because there is no path laid out before me. Before I go, I wanted to leave you with something Georgia O'Keeffe, a feminist painter, once said. I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I've wanted to do. Thank you.